Star Wars saved my life. Like, like, I know that we... Leslie Headland was at Star Wars Celebration talking everything the Acolyte. Here to talk about it is executive producer Leslie Headland. Hasn't Star Wars Celebration become a weird cultist gathering in the past few years? They could bring out The Last Jedi's broom boy and the place would have a meltdown. Christ, I reckon they could just bring out the broom. And grown men would not only cry, they'd film themselves crying and then upload it to YouTube to prove they are the biggest, bestest Star Wars fan. Yes, Leslie Headland, one of my all-time favourite people, who must be one of the luckiest people in Hollywood. The Acolyte is set approximately 100 years before The Phantom Menace, which helps with one of my long-term complaints of how every Star Wars live-action movie or show is set in this really tight time frame in the Star Wars history. Set during the High Republic, The Acolyte is a mystery thriller about a Jedi and her former Padawan investigating crimes. Personally, I wish they'd jumped a thousand years. I'd prefer to keep Disney as far away as possible from the Skywalker era. Awesome, awesome. The sycophantic eunuchs from Collider were obviously at Star Wars Celebration earning their money, shilling for Disney with their Disney-guided questions that are put there to sell the Disney message. Your series is dealing with stuff that like a lot of us want to see. I think so. With their connections, they were lucky enough to talk to Leslie Headland about the Acolyte. And boy, was that an enlightening three minutes. We learned how out of touch Leslie Headland really is with the Star Wars story and that she and Kathleen Kennedy don't quite understand the prequels. We got confirmation on Kathleen Kennedy's input on all new projects, which I never doubted anyway, but for some strange reason, there's people on Twitter that think she doesn't have any input at all. We got to find out the Collider will straight out lie for Disney. Isn't that a shocker? The Collider are just shills. <laughs> yes, we're all surprised. And we also got Leslie not only defending Ryan Johnson's Last Jedi, but she also decided to explain how we were all wrong about that film because we were too dumb to understand it. Yes, it's a wild three minutes, but first, let me give you a little background. Apparently, The Acolyte is going to be the most original Star Wars story ever. Leslie Headlands has decided to sell it as Kill Bill meets Frozen. Doesn't that get you excited? Nothing excites me more than an average TV showrunner comparing her creation to one of the greatest filmmakers of his generation and then adding that not only can she pull off that great feat of being as good as Tarantino, she can also combine the adult blood fest of Kill Bill with a very annoying kids film that appealed to very young girls. Now, I'm not saying Leslie would just say anything to promote her show. She's a woman of integrity. Lucky Leslie loves Star Wars so much, she actually broke down when saying just out of nowhere that Star Wars had saved her life. Just have to say, I, it is such an honor to be here. <laughs> like, Star Wars saved my life. Like, like, I know that we... And she's even such a pro that when she started crying, she didn't let any tears out to ruin that much-needed makeup. She can also just snap straight out of that broken-down state and back into her happy self like that sad emotion never existed. We're, we're not done yet, so we don't have enough to show yet, but I hopefully you will be able to see it soon. She's quite the professional. Now, some cynics might say that saying something saved your life is the newest go-to from the weirdos to get instant clout and sympathy from not only the soft-handed fans, but also the Hollywood powerful that allow these people to have careers. Star Wars saved my life. But I disagree. In no way was Leslie faking her emotion to get ahead. She's not that type of person. She's just extremely lucky. I mean, when she worked for Harvey Weinstein for six years as an assistant, and for some of that time as his personal assistant, she was lucky enough to not witness any bad behaviour from Harvey. How lucky is that? I know the cynics again will point to the personal assistants that came before and after Leslie Headland, all having the same story of being personally warned by previous employees about Harvey's behaviour. All she had said to me was, always sit in, a, in an armchair, <laughs> don't ever sit on a sofa next to him to wear more clothes around Harvey Weinstein's. They'll bring up the fact that Harvey had the same routine for years and always got his way. He didn't have a very original repertoire, you know, but it was a system that worked. But that's not Leslie's experience, according to her. And why wouldn't we believe her? The people that don't believe Leslie will also mention that other personal assistants to Harvey have also been accused of not only turning a blind eye to his open Hollywood secret. Congratulations, you five ladies no longer have to pretend to be attracted to Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> they also participated in helping Harvey abuse women, organising the meetings with young actresses for him, and even sometimes standing by the door while the abuse happened. Hollywood really attracts an amazing type of person, doesn't it? 
<laughs> but that's not the type of person Kathleen Kennedy would hire. Kathleen only hires people with integrity. I mean, she did chase Roman Polanski for years to work on projects with her after he was charged with raping a minor, but this time it's different. Leslie's different. She's different to the other 16 assistants that work for Harvey that complained about his behaviour. Those other 16 women that complained were just unlucky. I naively believed that if we went to Disney, they would be horrified and would fire Harvey or, you know, or help us with the proceedings. The lawyers made it very clear that that was not how the world worked. It's not like there was anything in it for Leslie to keep her mouth shut about Harvey's behaviour. Yes, I know people will point to all the other women who have said Harvey promised them a successful career in Hollywood if they just, in his words, took one thrust. He was also not afraid to say that it would be a quid pro quo. So if I did this, just one thrust and it would all be over, that I would then, you know, enjoy a, a rich and fulfilling career in film. But that's not Lucky Leslie's story. The fact that Harvey Weinstein, who was very particular about the scripts he purchased, but he bought Leslie's first ever screenplay, was in no way a hush payment or payback for taking one thrust. He solely bought her first script because it was just totally amazing. Yes, sure it was. Yes, I believe Leslie Headland when she says she knew nothing about Harvey Weinstein's behaviour, even though she was in contact with him day and night as his personal assistant. And the fact that in 2008 she wrote a comedy play about an evil boss who abused women, whose company name was a play on the Weinstein name, was to me even more proof that she didn't know anything. Yes, the play joked about how many women the boss went through and had jokes about how long one woman could last with the boss. But why would Leslie joke about that when, I mean, if she'd witnessed that behaviour firsthand? If Leslie had really seen what Harvey was like, those jokes would seem pure evil, as evil as Harvey. We're talking about Harvey Weinstein. Right. He's doing weird shit now to his assistant when I'm just sitting there. No, Leslie Hedlund is just extremely lucky. Lucky enough to have been helped by a serial rapist abuser who gave her a bunch of cash and a Hollywood career while expecting nothing in return. So when Leslie breaks down talking about how Star Wars saved her life, I totally believe her. If only the women who were served up to Harvey had Star Wars. Star Wars saved my life. Like, like... Jesus, I haven't seen fake crying that bad since Amber Heard was on the stand. Star Wars saved my life. Like... Agonising, painful... How can someone look like both the Walmart checkout girl who has lived on a diet of cheese and a white wine drinking Karen who keeps telling you they are not overreacting while screaming about the cat food prices? Leslie's also been telling everyone that the Acolyte will be like nothing else we have ever seen before in Star Wars because apparently for the first time we will be seeing the Jedi as these not so perfect people, which is fucking great because I'm sick of Disney always praising the Jedi and showing them as perfect beings. Yeah, I'm just so sick of it. Where were you while he was killing my friends? He was your Padawan. Why didn't you stop him? Why didn't you save us? Go away. A quick breather to talk about something everyone should have, a good VPN. With all the content clips I need for videos, the Robot Head channel couldn't exist without a secure and reliable VPN. So that's why I use the wonderful NordVPN. A VPN or virtual private network is a clever little tool that not only hides your location and protects you from all the online scammers trying to take your info or money, it also lets you watch the latest shows no matter where you live. As an example, we don't have HBO Max in Australia, so that means no The Last of Us for me. But with a single click on the NordVPN app, and now it looks like I'm living large in the US of A. And look at that, The Last of Us is mine to enjoy. Maybe Formula One is too expensive in your country. With NordVPN, you can just switch to a country where Formula One is free. It really is that easy. And it's really inexpensive. Plus, one account will protect up to six of your devices, so that's the whole family protected. So enjoy surfing the net, paying bills, or watching your favourite shows while being fully protected from those prying eyes. And that's even when you're out in public. Go to nordvpn.com slash robothead or use the link in the description to get their two-year plan with an exclusive deal plus four extra months. And that offer is risk-free because NordVPN offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? NordVPN, protect yourself online and have the freedom to safely do what you want to do. Go away. Find someone else. So anyway, Collider's interview, let's go and be ready for the Collider eunuch to impress you with his natural delivery of the Disney pre-written questions. Hit it, blood nut. This is the truth, is that when I pitched it, because I came in and I pitched my own idea, you know, I didn't come in and say like, 
what about baby Han Solo? You know what I mean? Like, I was like, I, I was like, what I'm really interested in is I'm really interested in uh, Star Wars from the perspective of the bad guys. I see. Leslie's brilliant original idea that wasn't baby Han Solo was to show the Jedi through the eyes of the bad guys because as she thinks, Star Wars is always about underdogs versus the huge empire. Star Wars is always about rebels versus institutional threat, right? Underdogs versus huge empire, right? Well, you would think that if you'd only watched Disney Star Wars because that's all they can think of. Then the Jedi become the antagonists. Not the bad guys, but they become the bad guys to the bad guys. And what did Kathy think? I gotta say, Kathy really responded to that. She really felt like that was a pocket of the universe that we had not seen, that nobody else had pitched her. Ah, I see. Kathy thought that it was part of the universe we'd never seen before. The head of Lucasfilm talking to a woman she's going to give many millions of dollars to to make Star Wars, and they both have either never watched or completely didn't understand the bloody prequels. Break through the fog of lies the Jedi have created around you. Yes, the prequels. Three films out of the original six that George Lucas made that showed the downfall of the Jedi and the rise of one of the most powerful Sith of all time. It was the bloody creation of Darth Vader who saw the Jedi as the enemy. So what the hell is Leslie talking about? I started to get more and more excited about doing something a bit different and something that was from the villain's perspective and something that maybe questioned the Jedi Order. Is Leslie Headland really that stupid? No, I don't think she is. Is she smart enough to manipulate Kathleen Kennedy, who has no idea what Star Wars is, and would be overly excited to have a lesbian woman making Star Wars? Yes! 1,000%! Leslie Headland wanted a sweet paycheck for making Star Wars, so she walked into Kathleen's office and got that by telling her that we'd never seen Star Wars from the Empire's slash dark side. Because I came in and I pitched my own idea. Even though the prequels did it, The Last Jedi did it, the Obi-Wan show tried to do it, even the latest terrible season of The Mandalorian has tried to do it. But to Kathleen Kennedy, it's a new idea. I gotta say, Kathy really responded to that. She really felt like that was a pocket of the universe that we had not seen. And then, Leslie, with the help of Collider's pre-scripted questions, sets up that it was really Kathleen Kennedy's project. I want to stop you there because one of the things that that a lot of fans won't know, and I, I sort of want you to actually talk about it, Please, yeah. is the fact that like uh, Kathy gets a lot of shit online. Yeah. But but I know that she was the one who made this show. Oh, one hundred percent. And how is that for a bit of blatant shilling? The Collider dude just randomly states to Leslie that the show is Kathleen Kennedy's project and links it to criticism she receives online. He says it as if the show is out and it's a great success and surprisingly, it was because Kathleen Kennedy was involved. <laughs> if anyone thinks this line just randomly came out of this guy's head and wasn't written by the Disney marketing department, I have some great waterfront property to sell you. And I think I want people to realize that there were maybe people in the orbit that were not on board with this show. Come on, it's pure publicity speak. You can tell because it doesn't make any f***ing sense. Kathleen Kennedy isn't criticised online because she isn't involved in projects. Kathleen gets criticism because she is involved in all the projects. And she makes terrible decisions. That's what publicists call reframing the criticism. And old Mr. Bloodnut Painted Nails here is the paid mouthpiece to deliver that reframing. But don't worry, they're not saying it for you and me. It's said for the popcorn munching normies. They don't care about all this stuff. And just hear that trolls criticise Kathleen online. And these guys have just let them know that she doesn't deserve it. Well, wake up, normies. Kathleen deserves the criticism. And it's not just Kathleen's image that needs a boost. Leslie decides to then reframe all the criticism of The Last Jedi. I think it's difficult to do a show that is critical in any way of the Jedi. And I think that you saw that with Ryan's film. I think that, that especially in that moment, people were very nervous about saying this particular institution may not be a perfect group of heroes that are totally nobly intentioned. The film didn't break the fandom because it had a terrible script that didn't make any sense, or the fact that Ryan changed everything about Luke Skywalker's personality in the attempt to make his amateur hour script work. No, it was none of that. It was because the population as a whole wasn't ready for any criticism of the Jedi, even though the three prequels movies was all about their failure. I am going to end this once and for all. You can't. He must stand trial. He has control of the Senate and the courts. He's too dangerous to be left alive. Do you understand? Leslie just thinks everyone was too immature to, to appreciate The Last Jedi. <laughs> The only funny bit out of this is that Leslie admits that people at Lucasfilm didn't want to do her idea because they're now admitting The Last Jedi was a failure. Leslie then completely contradicts herself by praising Dave Filoni, 
she accidentally skims across the fact that it was actually George Lucas who had shown us that the Jedi were not perfect in the prequels. And when, when one thing that I think Dave would say is that they, they are fallible. That's really the story that George told with the prequels, right? He sort of starts in media res and in, in, in Phantom, right? Like you're going to tell the story about bad guys and the Jedis might be the antagonist to that je to those Jedis. I think that makes people nervous. But it didn't make Kathy nervous. She's eating too much cheese. Brain's gone soft. That's a horrible thing to say. Then Leslie likes to just point out how easy it was for her to get the job. And I and I will say that that room, when I pitched her, it was it was probably probably one of the most exciting things because it felt like a conversation and less like I was up for a job. True. Yes, I'm sure it did feel more like a conversation than a job interview. This is Lucasfilm. The story ideas are far less important than your social standing. Being a female left-leaning feminist lesbian got you the job way before you walked through Kathleen Kennedy's door. And don't pretend it didn't. So be excited, all you masochists out there. The new Star Wars creator just passed the test. She praised Kathleen Kennedy, defended Ryan Johnson, and bowed down to Dave Filoni, while also downplaying George Lucas's work. And she did all of that within three minutes. That's the future of Star Wars, my friends. It's all about reframing George Lucas's original work and making it more like Frozen. And if you don't like the acolyte, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Like, Star Wars saved my life. <laughs>